right, so we can get started. We're um, very fortunate to have some special guests here today. We, we are having problems with the sound on the videos that you may have noticed, right? Um, uh, we, we have a, an extra microphone, but, uh, but um, technology is only, it's only helpful when it works, right? So, um, so we're going to try and um, have three of us share a, share a microphone and see if we can get the videos to come out as well as, as, well as we can. Um, so, um, yeah, so in uh, yes, yesterday's symposium at uh, Nursing and Engineering Innovation Center, uh, what seemed like one of the main takeaway themes that I that I noticed was was design thinking, right? Where where we have um, the type of problems that maybe nobody knows the solution to, right? So so this might be a little bit different than a than a traditional design engineering course where where maybe a company gives us a very well defined problem that we that we design to specific requirements and things like that uh, he, here we're here we're, we're trying to to find um, solutions to kind of a broad broad scope of problem zero in and see what kind of difference that we can make and probably nobody knows really what the solution is and we're very fortunate to have some special guest speakers here today uh, that, that have kind of a, a quintessential example of, of how, how that, something like that can be done and specifically towards inclusion, right? So that's what we're trying to, that's what you're looking at right now, right? Is, is uh, de inclusive design, design for inclusion, so what, what does inclusion look like? And, and here's, a, here's an example uh, today that, that can give us that, that kind of a, a, a broad view to it. And, and, and this example is looking at how do, how do we have uh, more diversity in, in STEM classes, more represent, representation of the general population, you know, I'll, all uh, groups and so forth in a fair way, and uh, that would be, you know, any improvements there would would be very helpful, right? And I think you probably understand why that is. And um, it, it, the uh, the challenge is to try and try and uh, bring younger folks into STEM, right? When we're when we're young, uh, you know, usually we don't like. Uh, math and things like that, right? Um, but what do we like when we're when we were younger, right? How many of us liked playing games with our friends when we were young, right? So, so, so maybe that's a way to to approach that that problem. And I'm just here kind of talking the talk, right? But but we we have special guest speakers who are actually doing this. They're they're implementing a solution and so I, I'm excited to to hear their story about how they how they made this happen um, how they started and where they are now how they got there and so forth uh, so I'd like to introduce mr. Don Wilson and he's he, yeah, yeah absolutely yeah give them give them a hand Thank you. yes and, uh, and mr. Mr. Mike Lonergan, um, and uh, Don, uh, I'll let him tell his story, but, but he's, he's been recognized by the mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut, as a, as a leader of the community, and also Senator Richard Blumenthal, a, a United States senator, has recognized him as a, as a local hero as well. Um, so, um, so this is a, a, a real, serious solution to this right and then and Mike uh, has has the technical expertise he he's an engineer at Sikorsky aircraft in that local area and um, he, he works on uh, helic helicopter systems you know some of the, 
the best helicopters that there are, uh, designing and um, systems engineering, IT systems and so forth. So they're a great team and um, they work you know, very well together on, on this. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Don and Mike, let them, let them take it away. You're my hero, Don's <laughs> my hero. If I could. Well, I want to thank everyone for their time this afternoon. Uh, it's a joy and a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited about, you know, where we are as an organization that we started from, you know, just a little rinky-dinky spot, and now, you know, we have such a great, um, amazing program. My name is Don Wilson, and I am the president and founder of Bridgeport Youth Lacrosse. And we have added a sports academy to that, um, to the lacrosse and the sports organization. We started with just lacrosse, right? And lacrosse is a sport that is non-traditional. So when we're talking about inclusive design and diversity and inclusion, when I started, I didn't even see that as, as a challenge, right? Because everything that we do, we say it's a challenge. It, it, it's something that we have to figure out. And, and from system engineers, we try to figure it out with uh, multiple solutions, right? How do we fix a problem and bring solution so that it affects a greater deal of people than just a single targeted audience, right? And I'm going to challenge you guys um, today. Um, one of my favorite things to do is think about the impact that you're going to have when you're designing your programs, right? So to be an impact thinker, right? If I'm thinking about something, what's the impact that it's going to have on the community, on my school, on my peers, on my family? Um, you know, just what's the impact uh, is it going to have? And so when I started this organization some 15 years ago, and we're celebrating 15 years, um, I really didn't have that thought of what the impact was going to be when I first started the organization. So I kind of grew into that, into the solution. And, and you guys are going to find that's what happens to a lot of you. You're going to grow into the solution, and you're going to find solutions to the problems, right? And sometimes it happens when you're not even expecting it. The other day, Mike calls me, and he goes, Don, I had to pull over on the highway because the solution came to me, right? So you never know where you're going to be when the solution comes to you. And a favorite quote of mine, um, I hope I don't mess it up. Um, <laughs> it's um, when you're still, the answers come to you, okay? When you're still, when you're quiet, the answers will come to you, all right? Um, and again, what was the main problem? So the main problem we were having in Bridgeport, Connecticut was lack of opportunity and lack of access. So for me, my, I, I grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is an affluent community. I went skiing, hiking, cliff jumping, all kinds of crazy things that you know, a normal black kid in Bridgeport, Connecticut wouldn't have an opportunity to do. So it starts there with the, with the problem and the challenge, right? And then, so I have a son and a daughter, and my son, um, both have graduated college, have their master's degree, they're working, they're 24, 26 and 25. Uh, my son, I just moved him into Manhattan, he has his own apartment, all that good stuff. So he's living life, right? And that was the thought process. How, when I first came here from Jamaica in 1979, the goal was to do better than your parents, right? It, that's always the goal, is to do better than your parents. So for, for me, education was always important. Education was always important. And I always try to make sure that 
every kid that I touch, we let them know that education is the most important thing first. Your money comes from merit scholarship first, and then it's the, ac um, the athletic part that comes afterwards after that. So, you know, that was our challenge, right? There's, there's a lack of opportunity in the community. And how do we address that lack of opportunity? So I'm driving my son back and forth to Greenwich, Connecticut, from Bridgeport, Connecticut, for 10 years, back and forth. And one day, it was, um, it, it was in, like, December, and he gets out of school at half a day every Friday at 12 o'clock. And we're on the highway, and it's four hours. It's usually a 45-minute ride to Bridgeport, and it's four hours. There was traffic, it was snowing, it was a light snow, the road had froze over. And he looks at me and he says, Dad, I can't do this, this is 10th grade. I can't do this anymore. Um, I can't, it's killing me. Like, I don't get enough sleep. Um, it's like, you're, it's just too much. So he decided, he decided that it was just too much for him, so he didn't want to go to Brunswick anymore. And I had to find a new school for him. And we, there goes the process again. I had to start the whole process over. So that lack of diversity and inclusion that in Bridgeport, I had to go outside to find programs for him. And, and that was what led me to my why. Why do I want to do this? Why do I want to start a youth program in Bridgeport um, where the opportunities are not great. There's not a lot of finances. People can't afford to pay for certain programs. Uh, and when we're talking about STEM, you guys understand that this is kind of elite, right? Um, at the top of the level, it's not trickling down into the basic the, the community centers unless there's people bringing it there. Versus like in like in, in Greenwich or in you know Westport or those other communities, it's offered. It's it's there. It's you know within the games that the kids play, um, the toys that their parents buy their kids. Those games, some of them are STEM related. The computers that they buy for them, the programming that they buy for them, and you guys have to understand lack of opportunity, lack of access, lack of just diversity and inclusion in that community in terms of what's available to the community, right? So that, that challenge became my goal of how do I solve this problem, right? So we started a lacrosse program and, you know, lucky, luckily we had three kids that were going to Brunswick at the same time and they were all lacrosse players. So they were pretty good lacrosse players. So it made it easy for me to start recruiting kids around them, right? Um, so that's how we recruited kids. Because I know a lot of you are, how did you recruit the kids, right? Um, that was how we were able to recruit the kids. We were in the, and I started going to the schools, started doing after school programs within the schools. And so we were able to outreach and, and attract more kids into, into our program. And so the challenge still remains of how do we provide safety equipment for these kids that can't afford it, right? They can't afford um, this program. STEM, I mean, uh, lacrosse is an elite sport. It's an it, it's, it's Ivy League sport. It's not something that was, was at UB at the time when I start. It's, it wasn't even in our community. So, Telling something about something that they can't see and touch, and they don't have a superhero like a Michael Jordan, like, oh, that's Michael Jordan, he plays basketball. I could play basketball, right? I, don't ha I didn't have a Miles Jones, if some of you guys know lacrosse now, you have a Miles Jones who's like the Michael Jordan of lacrosse. Um, so we didn't have that when I first started. That became another challenge. How do you sell something that nobody knows anything about, right? Especially the community have no idea, there's no, there's no relative, relativity to that sport. In our community, it's basketball, football, soccer, because it's all culturally based, all right? So that became another part of the challenge is 
how do you create a culture for sports, right? And so we did that. Um, we created that culture. And then, you know, out of that, that challenge, we, we started the lacrosse program. It was very successful. We had teams that won, like, state, um, not the state championship, but, like, local tournament championships. And the kids really bought into it and loved the game. So it helped us to be able to expand and to attract more kids. Out of that, we started the Sports Academy. And so the Sports Academy now is everything else other than lacrosse. So we do flag football, we do track and field, we do soccer, and then we started doing STEM. About four years ago, um, I was introduced to STEM curriculum and eSports. Um, and I fell in love right away because secretly I was like a nerd. I was, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I used to write, um, you guys, uh, back in like the 80s when, um, when they start writing basic computer language, I used to be, I went to a cluster program which was a science and technology program. Um, they had a business um, section and then they had a communication. But I was in the science and technology part. I, I love science. I love math and science. I, I, I actually did really love that stuff. So when I was introduced to um, coding, and I didn't know it was called coding at the time, um, I, was writing soft, I was writing codes and didn't know actually what I was really doing because I, I just believe the teacher, he, he was just there, right? And he, he, he knew how to teach, but he didn't know how to relate it to what, you, what the outcome would be. So remember I said you have to be an impact thinker. What's the impact going to be? He could teach the class, but he couldn't tell us what the impact was going to be, what the outcomes were going to be, right? So I, I, I fell in because I just love that stuff. I love writing the language, computer language. Back then it was called BASIC, Fortran, Pascal, and I'm going way back, all right? Um, those are language that, those were computer languages that we used to create designs on the computer. Um, I would be doing like something like W equals, um, and it would be a grid. So you'd have the 60 line of the grid on top, and then you have the numbers on the side. So when you say like it's A65, it would be a colored spot, and then you could choose the color in that spot, and then it would make and then you could make a design, but you would have to write each color, each code, all of that. So I was introduced to that when I was in high school. And so when eSports came along, I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. And you know, for us as an organization, we want to meet kids where they are. So like your professor said earlier, how many of you guys raised your hand when you said when you were younger you was gaming, right? A lot of you was gaming. A lot of these kids are, what, what are they doing? Gaming, right? So how do we reach kids where they are? So we started uh, our eSports program, and, and, and I'm just going to pause it really quickly right there, and I'm just going to tell you how I met Mike into all of this, right, before we go any further. So I'm also the head lacrosse coach at Notre Dame Fairfield in, um, in, in, in downstate, down in Connecticut. Um, and I started a youth, the youth program had grown so much that I was attracting kids from Trumbull, Stratford, Milford, all over the place. And Mike's son was one of those kids that we attracted to the program. Um, and he was a lacrosse player at Notre Dame Fairfield. That, I wasn't the head coach at that time, but you know, a bunch of those kids came to our team and we played in a few tournaments, had some great success. It was a lot of fun getting to know the kids, getting to impact them, getting to teach them about sportsmanship, character, character development, all of those kind of tangible benefits that comes from being on a team, um, playing on a team sport, stuff that you guys tangible need now. How do we work together, right, as a team to come out with a solution, 
right? And I think everybody understands that. Uh, so that's how I met Mike. And then, you know, um, five years ago, I got hired as the head coach at Notre Dame Fairfield. And I'm looking around and I'm saying, uh, who's going to be my assistants? And Mike was one of my assistant coaches. And there was another coach there. His son played for me. His, name, uh, his son's name was Manny, Manny Rosales. He was my other assistant coach as well. So I try to keep my family tight. And when I say family, I mean even people who work with me, I try to keep it tight, right? Because it matters. It matters. You want that consistency, that continuity, you want that from the people that you're working with. Because if you're always having change and total changeover, you have to train again and start all over. And, you know, it just, it just creates a nightmare situation. And it's just more work than you, than you want to do, right? So loyalty is very important in every aspect that, of business, of your friendships, of family, everything. Loyalty is very important. Um, and I just wanted to create, uh, and so Mike and I, um, you know, he came, I, I, I'm, I'm going through coaching and coaching, and then the esports thing come along, the STEM stuff come along, and I knew Mike was working at Sikorsky um, as a wind tunnel test pilot engineer. And so how do we connect sports, STEM, esports, all of that together? Right? How do, you, how do you do that? And I know you guys are thinking from system engineers, like, oh, this is cool. I hope you guys are thinking, like, this is so cool. Like, this is radical, right? Because this is revolutionary stuff. Okay, guys? Um, how do you connect sports to STEM? Right? And how do you connect a kid in a wheelchair to sports? And have that kid have a meaningful experience Within that, within, that, within that setting, right? So one of the things, a kid could roll up in his wheelchair with his computer and take stats, right? Easy, right? That's easy, right? You just connected, you just made that connection for that kid. Like, now I could talk to the athlete and I'd be like, hey, these are your stats. And, and it's coming from a kid in a wheelchair and you're looking at him, listening to him, that's respect. That's respect right there. So you just made that connection for a kid in wheelchair to sports. What could be more powerful than that, right? Because now you're introducing that kid to a team. He's part of that team. He may never have been a part of a team before, right? Now he's a part of a team. He's connected. He, he, he's, he's doing something. He may not be the one running or kicking the ball, but he's very valuable. If you guys notice on a NFL sideline, you see all these guys running around with their little computers. They're just as valuable. Moneyball. You got, how many of you guys have seen Moneyball? Right? Those guys are just as important because given the stats and, and creating those stat sheets and being able to read those things and make it valuable and tangible helps the athlete on the field and it helps that athlete to process information. So that's, that's all this is. If I give you a fact sheet and I could help you understand how to process it, that makes you a better person, a better athlete, a better overall for whatever you're doing, right? For whatever you're doing. So this is how Mike and I connected and immediately I saw the connection. Immediately. I was like, oh my God, this is brilliant. STEM. And how do we, and, and, and connecting kids to this that, you know, otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity. And that's where the system, the healthcare system is, is impacted right there, right? So if we're creating healthy communities, right? Healthy, vibrant communities, then you're changing the healthcare system. You're changing the health of the community, the health of the state, the health of the country. Because if you're creating healthy kids that could think, that could, you know, that could, you know, have rational, have rational thinking, um, and create and to be impactful in their communities, then that's how you guys become impactful, 
right? Because now you are impacting your community, right? I'm thinking as an impact thinker. When I go back home to uh, Dorchester, Massachusetts, or whatever, I used to live in Dorchester. Um, when I go back home to Dorchester and I see a problem in Dorchester, now, and I start thinking about it, I'm thinking about the impact, right? I'm thinking about solutions, outcomes, right? And that's, that's how I try to formulate myself as how do I become, how do I impact my community? And I tell you guys, all the accolades, all that stuff really doesn't matter to me because my pride and joy is my two kids, right? To see that they have gone through this system, they're successful, and they could take care of themselves in every aspect, I think that's, that's every parent's dream. Every parent's dream, right? To see each and every one of you go out into the world and do what you love to do, figure it out, and be successful at it. Don't call me. <laughs> I'm just kidding, okay? Uh, I tell my kids that all the time, jokingly. Like, don't call me unless it's, like, the world is burning down or something like that, right? Because what I believe is if we give you guys the right tools, the right tools to go out into the world and be successful, there's no way you're not going to be successful. There's just no way, right? S stuff happens. We understand that. But at the same time, we want to give you the tools that will make you successful, all right? Um, and, you know, most of this thing, uh, one of the awesome things we also did with our kids is we thought we, we teach, we taught them how to be uh, mindfulness, right? So again, there's the challenges in the community, the challenges. As you guys will discover, there's layers to these challenges, right? So I want to teach lacrosse. Lacrosse is a thinking sport. If I get a kid that comes to me from home hungry, that kid can't play sports. If I get a kid that comes to me and that kid had a fight or something like that in their neighborhood and they're afraid to go back home because they know what the repercussions are going to be, they're going to get jumped or whatever, I can't teach that kid, right? So we call those adverse childhood experiences, trauma, poverty, um, lack of access, opportunities, all of those things. If you get a kid that, you know, for whatever reasons, can't focus on what you're teaching them or whatever you're trying to communicate to them, there's just no way that they're going to learn or process what you want them to process. And remember, as a coach, I only get two hours, an hour and a half. That's a really quick time to try to impact these kids. But we get them, the way we have designed the program now, um, holistically, we try to approach it from a holistic standpoint where we have um, mentors, we have social workers that come in and talk to these kids. And I'll just give you a quick story. I had a, uh, two, two weeks in a row. Uh, we started our, our fall program. Um, mom puts kids in, kid in the car. He doesn't know where he's going. Just throw him in the car, doesn't know where he's going, shows up at the field, have a meltdown. I don't want to be here. I didn't know I was coming here. I don't want to do this. Um, I don't like exercise. All of those, you know, he's failing. He's flailing, flaring, right? We had a social worker right there on site. Luckily, it was one of those, we were doing an open house, and luckily he, she was there. She took that kid, walked him around the track a couple of times, found out all of that information that I just told you guys. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't want to be there, all of that kind of stuff. And she walked him around the track a couple of times, calmed him down, and, was, and, and said to mom, take him home, and then we'll see him next week. Next week, we had the same issue with a different kid. That kid from the first week took that kid, walked him around the track, and had the same solution. Same solution. It was amazing to see. So you know the planting those little seeds can grow and blossom into some beautiful flowers, right? 
And that's what we want to see for our kids is them blossoming. And, and, I, and the thing about it is giving them opportunities, um, just creating awareness that this is here and you could take part in it. Like lacrosse is was something that half of these kids still think is like, oh, we don't play that. That's not for us. And I'm, all I'm doing is trying, it's just there. And I've been consistent. It's there. If you want to play, and I was, we were joking on the way coming up, Coach Mike and I, and um, I was saying to him, my, grand, my grandmother always had these little sayings, and one of their saying was, whosoever will, may come. We could make it, but if you have the will, you may come or you may not come, right? But it's your choice, right? It's a choice, but it's there. It's there. And that's what was lacking in the community. It was not there, right? And so now we have provided this service for the community, and it's there. And it's consistently there. We make it safe. We provide the uh, equipment for the kids. So we make it safe. We've gone out and got the funding so every kid could play. Transportation is still our biggest challenge right now where, you know, we'll have stuff going on and the parents have two, three jobs. They can't drop the kids off. They're at work. They're, you know, they're washing clothes or whatever. Doing, doing, they can't get the kids to practice. So we're working on transportation. But that, those are the solutions. Um, in inner cities that you know really tend to help providing awareness opportunity and just giving kids a chance to be exposed to certain um, activities um, is what we've been really great at um, and so now you know with the stem and the inclusion in that this we've We've really been fortunate and creative as an organization because we don't have a space. We don't have an actual building that we run our STEM program out. And for the last four years, we've been really successful running it outdoors. So I believe in when school's out, I don't want kids in a building. I don't want kids in a building. I want them outside, running around, playing, on the playing field, hiking. We are fortunate that my facility is called 90 Acres. We have two turf fields. We have hiking trails. Um, hiking trail leads right to the Discovery Museum where we have our partnership with the Discovery Museum where um, it's now a science center and they're partner with um, Sacred Heart University and they're doing a lot of STEM research um, um, a lot of projects, robotics. So we, I was fortunate to, to, to land into that. And we have this great partnership with them where we send kids over. I don't know if you professors sent you guys a video earlier of our STEM, of our summer um, of STEM. And I hope some of you guys watched it. So this stuff, you could see it when I'm talking about it. Like kids walking through the woods, going through the science center. Um, actually doing experiments in the Science Center and, and, and just having a great experience. We also have the zip line course right behind the Science Center. So they get to go zip lining and stuff like that. So, you know, they'll take a day where they're walking through the woods, they're going to the Science Center, and then they're going zip lining. And so just giving kids those kind of opportunities. Um, like I said, I went cliff, cliff jumping, skiing, I still ski. One of my favorite things to do. Um, and, and kids don't get this opportunity. And they think I'm crazy. Coach, you going skiing? Yeah, I'm going skiing. Like, Coach, you really going skiing? Yeah, I'm going skiing. And they think I'm crazy. So we're planning to take some of these kids skiing as well. Um, I just saw last year, like, Hartford has this ski program for inner city kids. And I was like, yes, this is amazing. Just giving kids opportunities and exposing them to things I think um, it just makes the world a better place. So if I could get you guys to be impact thinkers um, and just think about the world, um, like we're all a part of the world, right? And if we make the world a better place for everybody, then it just works better for everybody. 
right? It's just more opportunities. It's just, it just, it just works better for everybody. Culture, I, I, I'm sure you guys like, I came here from Jamaica in 1979. You guys don't hear a lick of accent, right? Right? A lick of accent, right? Just a little bit? It's a little bit, all right? But that's what I want to be able to create for these kids. Like, they could go over here. So, like, my son is a perfect example. So, we lived in Bridgeport, which is inner city, and we drive 45 minutes down the road to Greenwich, which is really affluent, right? But he knows how to survive here, and he knows how to survive over here, right? And, and most of the time, we're either in survival mode, because some of, some of us, if we go to New York, we're scared, right? We're in survival mode. Like, how do I survive New York, right? New York is, is way down now. It, it's not like the New York of back in the days, like, anybody could go to New York now and survive, right? Back in the days, it was hard. It was hard, all right? But that's the kind of um, people we want to create that you could survive in any situation, whether you're in Greenwich, Connecticut, or you're in the worst part of Springfield, Massachusetts, right? You could survive. You know how to act. You know how to carry yourself. And these are the life skills that we're teaching our youth. Because I have kids at RPI that are, you know what I mean? Um, I got a kid this year, uh, we were just talking, um, D1, he's going to the Air Force, right, Air Force Academy. So we know that the blueprint that we have created within our organization, if people follow that blueprint, it works. It works. Um, because we are actually sending kids to really, really good schools right now, and I'm really, really proud of that, right? Um, we're changing lives. And, and from a youth program that started with just lacrosse, we've added yoga to teach kids how to be mindful, how to stay in the game. Um, because when we first started, I, I, it was a lot of other challenges that, you know, referees were mean to us and people didn't like us because, you know, I've, I show up with an all-black team and people would ask, is there any white kids on your team? And I'm like, look, all, every other team out here is all white teams. We're the only one. And I, I'm sure you guys know if you've ever watched lacrosse, like it's still like just like a uh, fraternity sport, put it that way, right? Um, but we show up and people would be like, is there any white kids? We have Spanish kids, but we don't have any white kids on our team. And it's fine. Now we do, you know? But all around us, we're surrounded by all these teams that are all white, um, and we don't have a problem. So this is, where, this is how I try to teach my kids to be able to survive wherever you are. And don't take on, like, you know, people be racist and people say nasty comments and da-da-da-da-da. You don't have to take that on. We taught you how to be in control of your emotions and to be in control of yourself so you don't have to react, all right? And that's, that's our story. That's our story. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Just being in control, though, all right? Okay. Thank you, guys, again. Mike up here also because he has, you know, other perspectives working on the team and he's had a lot to the, From to the, the STEM, STEM <laughs> part of it. Hello, my name is Mike Bottom. All right, God is the man, um, as you just recognized. Um, when we talked about coming up here, um, there's a connection um, Doug brought out to us and how it all can. He started your class by telling you, you know, you're going to be faced with problems you don't know yet. There's problems out there that we don't know what they are, okay? And the class that you're included in, okay, is one of those classes is that they're reaching the different places and through the process, 
forming you know, systems engineering or a systematic approach or a cultural approach. Well, um, quick background. 25 years at Sikorsky Aircraft for Lockheed Martin. Um, I'm a wind tunnel test engineer primarily. Uh, I've been trained as an engineer. If I'm not doing it at work, I'm doing it at home. That's my passion at work. All right, similar to Don, I have a, a, a boy and a girl. That's my passion. My wife's been married for over 25, 30 years. Don't, don't hold that to me, don't tell anybody um, that I don't remember that kind of stuff. Um, if you haven't noticed, I have an accent too. It's just not Jamaica, it's Jamaica, Queens, not Jamaica, the island, okay? Um, it's a little different, it hasn't gone away. My kids don't have it, they grew up in Connecticut, all right? I couldn't teach my kids English because the English teachers would yell at me for my accent. Um, I couldn't pronounce it the right way. So the combination here that me, when he introduced me and I came through was literally through lacrosse. All right, passionate sports fan, close to Long Island. Love the game, love teaching kids, love coaching kids, okay? Um, always very competitive. And when we had the opportunity to play lacrosse through things, it was just my son was never a football player, never a basketball player, never, you know, he, he came home one day because of the Rosales boys and he said, hey, this is cool. And I was like, yippee, right? You know, I, I want to, I love the game, right? So it was natural to do that, and he got involved. And it was, he was in Milford Youth, played with them, and then ended up in Bridgeport Youth. Now, I want to give you guys perspective. How many is, what, what kind of background do you hear in school for? Mechanical engineer. Some other names. Biomedical engineer. Biomedical. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Just those two primarily, right? So. Why are you listening to a guy named Don Wilson from Bridgeport Mitchell Cross that had a solution? What's the connection? Where are you gonna see it? All right, Don didn't even know he had your solution, or like when we talked to Doug, 75% of a problem that we didn't even know was out there. Don did this intuitively, all right? And I say that and I bring that up because as engineers, we typically get the requirements it shouldn't be intuitive. We go to work, we solve the problem. Okay? It's easy if the problem is there, that's after that. You know what the problem is. When you don't know the problem, and that's what you're preparing for, all right, you need that. Okay? It's an example. You look out, your, your collection, your data research comes from practical resources. Where has it been successful? Where has it not been successful? What works, what doesn't? So that's the connection for us when he here talk. My connection to Don is very simple. It's not aerospace, okay? Commitment to see the same thing he sees from teaching youth sports and what lacrosse was. What was neat about lacrosse for us, I was one of the only white guys on that field with him. <laughs> and my son was. What they called him, Oreo? <laughs> All right, he was on that field. We showed up, okay? And I'm from Queens. I have no problem going to New York anytime. So for me, it was all right. But in Connecticut, I, I learned a long time ago of privilege. All right, there's a lot of non privilege that happens there. And so for me, it's easy to give back. And that's why I'm doing it. That's why I'm here, in that sense. Um, when the connection came up between coaching, he doesn't let me coach anymore because I don't have a good record. I'm not, I, I get the development team and we don't know we win. So he leaves that for the pros. In science, it was simple for me. Requirements, my background, and I'm biased, I'm a mechanical engineer. All right, that's the passion I have. Um, master's degree. Four years in the military, Queensboro, Hayden School, Hofstra, Hayden School, University of New Haven, still Hayden School, love engineering. Okay, you kind of get a flavor that I do it because I, I got curious and that's the passion to do. Similar to you guys in the future, you don't know what I'm going to do. But if you have a passion and curiosity, this is the kind of stuff that gets it. All right, this is you find purpose, you find the why. The why for me was very simple. When he had and I watched the team play and stuff like that. I always thought about, I'm not going to make great lacrosse plays, but I can definitely do good lacrosse plays. And I'm a typical engineer. I have to process, shoot, go, be a threat. I had PowerPoints for him to share with him. And Notre Dame team. This me a chance. He said, Mike, I got something else. It makes me sit into uh, Discovery Museum COVID class, and we're doing rocket. We're doing a mission to Mars that they're doing virtually with third and fourth grade. Think about this. During COVID, they got this guy from engineering for 25 years, talking to kids that had trouble getting on the internet, and the great support staff at Sacred Heart had students that were volunteering that went to a mission from Mars scenario. 
and the connection went. We don't need, you know, we need the sport, but we don't need, you know, COVID or not, we can participate. And I, I started making a connection between what we can do science-wise to help sport. Then the esports thing came up. All right, esports is very simple. And I, I know that it's Damon out there. What was the earliest video game you ever played? Yeah. Which one? Anybody else? How old? How far back? Pokemon on the Game Boy. Pokemon on the Game Boy. Oh, no. Pac-Man. Did you play Miss Pac-Man? I was privileged. I had Pong. And I had to fix the television every time we ran. And then my, my, my claim to fame was Atari. And then we figured how to cheat Atari and we can play it for millions of, millions of points. Um, so when I came back to esports, it was like, why are we playing? Think about it. This is youth, look, youth, youth lacrosse, youth sports. He doesn't want them staying in school. He wants to get them out, put them on the field. So why would we be telling kids to go back and play video games? Think about the parents. Think about us coming to the parents and saying, you know what? I got a deal for you. I want your kids to play video games with me. <laughs> right? No chance. It, 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 it's not intuitive. Okay? Yet. If you go to the source, all right, and my son now is five years in the military, my daughter's very to graduate from Sacred Heart in a year, she's in nursing. My son still spends more time playing video games and talking with his friends thousands of miles away in the cohorts against each other, okay? Single shooter, team shooter, they're playing. The kids are doing that. How many of you guys play games now, right? Game comps, stuff like that. One step better. Don doesn't have a building, remember? He got so many bike computers, we don't got gaming computers. All right? Esports starts out the very bottom. NASAC was a, a free uh, an organization, National Scholastic um, Confederation, uh, Esports Confederation. All right? They have basically a free, uh, it was a philanthropist set it up that has a STEM curriculum around building a club, all right, to play video games. That was it. And everything that went into building that club was STEM related because they're all STEM curriculum like you guys are here now. But more importantly, it was focused around the team. Be on the team, form your own team. It gives empowerment. These kids will get skill sets with STEM curriculum. So that's where my head was and was like, all right, we can do this. I'm not a teacher, but I know a little bit of STEM, I know the curriculum. We can give these something to put on their resume if they do this. At the same time, it's sports, folks, the sports academy. No, not on the field, but we're in COVID, so it was a solution. So they kind of filled the gap. But then it started to go. What eSports did, in my head, was basically say, why can't we bring everybody else in? When I say that, he mentioned it. What comes to mind? How would that, somebody raise their hand? Moneyball, right? What was the premise of Moneyball? Game the system. Oh, OK, game the system, how? Oh, they wanted to see if statistics could pick a team. Stats, statistics, right? Now, think about it. Let me get a group of kids. I already have them. Let me get a league that they play. Why can't I build a club that brings the non-athletes that are friends, family, or other kids, boys, girls, independent of team, right? Why can't I have them come and be part of the team? Every professional team you see out there, every college team you see out there of any there is more assistant helpers than there are players on the team. Those assistants are not just doing the sport. Everything they're doing technically is a STEM related career. Everything, think about this. Million dollars in football and all the big sports. So the, the model is simple. We got diversity, we got kids, we brought in the cities. Go get a scholarship, go be a superstar. The Michael Jordans and stuff like that, right? What's the number? Less than 2%, even less than that. It's probably like 0.5% of people of non-availability, non-inclusive, less neighborhoods to be able to get that magnitude of income at a certain point in their future. All right, what are the rest of them do? The NCAA commercial is great. The rest of these go on to be productive people because you got school, right? Or you get an injury. So here sports starts falling down. So what fixed sports? STEM. Teach them the same skill at the same time they're learning sports. And make them learn early. And how do you make somebody learn? 
One of the coolest things about this is you would think this is from a, a, a school, right? Teachers, after school program, stuff like that. The best thing about Bridgeport News, they don't have a building. Think about this. Show up at a field, rain, stop shine. I think we gotta stop when they're lightning, mm -hmm. right? We gotta get up, sometimes the snow's too heavy. And the difference here is, his foundation for lacrosse, because that unique sport, is grounded. It talks about respect your competitors. It talks about respect your body, okay? He has a code of conduct that these kids sign, and they look at you and they sign the commitment. This is not forcing somebody to go to school. You don't have to graduate from this place. You have to choose to participate, and you have to choose to come. What's mama say? Grandma? Grandma say, you know? They will show. If they want, they will come. And when they do, though, you have a different group of people. All right? And the advantage to me was that's the group of people you want to impact. That's the group of people you want to understand. So we have, we're still challenged. One of the greatest successes I think we had is I'm a system, you know, engineer. I wouldn't say a systems engineer. What's the first thing that comes to mind? I sat down, I had the graph paper out. I said, Don, I need this, I need this, I need that. He says, we don't got that. We don't do that. Okay, how about this? How are we going to participate? Kid named Daylon. He was a goalie. I'll go back a little bit. When I was at Notre Dame, Daylon was going to Notre Dame. He also played on Don's team. He had an opportunity to go to, uh, to, to high school. 6'4", 6'5", 6'4", 300. <laughs> when you're a lacrosse person, and you guys know lacrosse game? I know, I, I keep allud alluding to this, okay? What's the best position for six? Right? Six, five, 300 pounds. Goalie. Right there as a goaltender. All right? He never picked up a stick before in his life except for what we had. He didn't even know the game. Okay? Even more, I was as a volunteer. As a volunteer, I'm not there for any accolades. I'm there. To me, I was getting old. I get to work out with school. I used to jog behind him. He was the slowest one on the team. We do laps. I would run behind him. Right? And it was cool. Because I can't say it was, I couldn't keep up with anybody else, but I could keep up with Dale. So he got the pleasure of getting stuff talking to Coach Mike. So I follow him around. Long story short, fast forward four years. He graduates, gets a scholarship, he's going to RPI. RPI. He comes back as a camp counselor, first year of school for Bridgeport Youth uh, Sports Academy. And he's my esports kid. No script, no plan, what do we do? Bailon, I sat down with him a couple hours. We go through the ASAP thing, we go through his minors. Okay. He sets up the Discord by himself. He has the kids playing. We don't have computers. What do we use? We download Rocket Ball, because that's the fundamental one in esports. They're playing it on their phones. He's running the Discord every two nights after camp on the phones. The kids are talking to each other, running Discord, practicing Rocket Ball. Now, if any of you just tried Rocket Ball, it's free. Download it on your, on your, your phone. I'm still, I haven't gotten past the exercise yet. Okay? So my challenge to the kids this year is I was going to go challenge one of them. It didn't work out. So the point there was I'm looking from an engineering perspective. I'm looking from an adult perspective, an advisor perspective. This is the way it should be. Right? So technically, Don has a problem. He's asking me for help. Let me try to solve it. Right? I think I know the problem. It, it, it's not. It's don't get limited to that. The impact was started, okay? And how many of you are kind of software related? You know what Agile means nowadays? How many heard of Agile? What's it mean in software? Oh, uh, the reason. Yeah. It iterates development, right? And the ability of Agile, you know, because it was a big term and it was about 10 years old, and I'm a hardware guy, so I still don't understand what it is. But you test out the thing. How many are aggravated when your phones need an update? Right? Everything you put in the software, they do as fast as possible. They put it out to a, a limited population. If it's good, they incorporate it. If it's not, they go through it. And the faster they do it, they get customer feedback. It's instant. More and more and more and more. That's the way the software business is driven. That's the way Apple built it. That's the way currently um, process or systems engineering is being developed. All right? Test it. Put it out there. Test it. Does it work? Does it satisfy the solution? Yes. Move forward. Bring with the feedback. Bring the solution with you. Keep going. If it's no good, pivot, shift. Do the iteration again. Okay? Don does that with his sports program. 
the moment we bumped into it, he, he, he said, let's not wait. We got an esports team. Okay, Daylon has the thing, he gets together. We participated. It's not a big thing. Bridgeport Ecosystem was formed from the, the organizations and stuff like that. NASEF had come in, they organized a Rocket League tournament. It was hosted at Lusitana uh, Community College. On a big screen. Big screen. And, and remember, imagine now esports, for those who are not familiar yet, imagine going into a basketball stadium or a football stadium. They run it now in Vegas. It's the big screen television, and there's kids playing video games, and you got people parlaying and betting on it. Now it's an industry. Now it's people making money. Okay? And there's, there's open tournaments out there, like right now. You think Cornhole was big? They're doing this for a lot. People are getting sponsored to play video games for a living. Now, I'm not sure if when I was playing video games, I imagined they're doing it for a living. I definitely didn't know when I had my kids that I would be telling them you can do it for a living. Okay? And I'm not sure I'm good enough now to do it for a living. But the same aspect applies as I was referring to professional football, professional baseball. Every team that you form, training, data collection, analysis, right? Optimum performance, strategy, all of those things go on the same thing. So you take the esports model now and you throw it into community. And what's included? I don't just have to have somebody who wants to come out and play sports. I can bring people out, I can go meet the math teacher, make the math club, let's take stats. I'll teach them the game, tally mark here, do it by hand, get a computer, either way you want to do it, let's go to Excel, let's plot it on graphs. All right, let's put it into analysis, let's make trends, numbers, everything. What was the temperature, the home game, away game, night time, how many ground balls, how many, how many lost pass, take them. Right? Do a couple weeks of it. Let them form it. Teach them math. Teach them graph. Right? What's the linear trend? Okay? Predict it. Now, bring that to the coaches that are coaching now in his teams and say, all right, here's the incentive for your players. If you get good stats, you will start. If you don't, you're going to be second. And we'll give you shared time. Now, I'm letting kids that predict that are not the greatest or the best. And now, based on their performance, I'm going to let them participate, and it's going to demonstrate performance. It's going to move forward. Now we start giving the skills come back. Somebody gets hurt, what replaces it, right? Then you start teaching kids the realization that math and statistics is the closest thing to fortune telling that we have today. It's weather-based. We're 50-50 with weather, right, most of the time. But that's, a, that, that's predicting the future. 400 years ago, if you're going to tell me when the, you know, when it was going to rain, that's how we, we planted the grass. That's how we planted the corn. The Indians used to do it thousands of years ago. And that's a connection with the cross. It's a circle. It's learned early. Predict. All right? When you, when you can make that connection for people, and it's not just in lacrosse, it's in anything, and it's all inclusive. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be a deep boy or girl. It's not separated, okay? And we're bridging this, the disability gap. You know, wheelchairs seem simple. You know, why wouldn't anybody, if you're gonna make a, a, a ramp to get into a building, why shouldn't it only be a ramp? It satisfies anything. I don't really need stats. It should always be a ramp. Now, you automatically include the, the wheelchair there. But what about those kids that had the meltdown? Autism is not a disability. It's actually a benefit, depending what perspective you look at it because they have special skills that they are refined and very sensitive to, okay? What about people that had something that they don't have now? Ask a blind person how many senses or how many things they feel, ones that have been born from blind from the beginning or those that have been blinded since, okay? Make those connections with people. And then on top of it, here's the summation for you and your class. Top 50 companies in, in, in the world right now Money-wise, their executives, it's very, very clear. Diversity and inclusion for decision-making purposes. Just for decision-making purposes. Give them a 20 to 30, 40% advantage over their peer companies. What's that mean? I need a class, look at yourselves. Look at the person sitting next to you. And if they look like you, great. If they don't, it's even better. And that's the kind of teams you want to be on. 
I told Don, what do we teach for sports? I hire engineers, okay? It's aerospace. How many females do you think I have working for me? Technically zero with aerospace now. Oh, yeah. I, I say that, but I'm very proud of it because the two that I did have have taken better positions and I put them in a position to be in better places. So now they, they're, they're running their own teams. Okay? It is about getting inclusive ideas and thoughts into your design, running that data, collecting those, that process, and then choosing the best one. And then when you choose it, test it. And when you test it, collect the data. And if you're not sure about the data, if it's not 100%, test it again. And then make the change and do it again. And if you're missing something, look around. Okay? That's why Don is here again, and we're gonna figure out all the rest of our 25%. So his students and those kids come back, and they give what I'm giving now, because they went through the process. Now, we talk about recruiting. What's better than coming back from a Lockheed Martin after doing four years and now you live in Bridgeport? Right next door, I'm, it's a five minute drive to Bridgeport for me from work. I'm bringing systems engineers that basically can go back and teach STEM classes for eSports and video. That's a full cycle. And a systems engineer, when you design now, you need life cycles, right? Once you build it, you gotta figure out how to dispose of it. Whether it's five years or 100 years. And putting it in space or putting it in the bottom of the ocean doesn't work anymore. Right? Questions? Comments? For Don? I wasn't thinking of coming on. Where do you get most of your funding? Great, great question. So, funding, we do fundraisers. Over the years, we have developed fundraisers, tournaments. Uh, we charge like a really nominal fee, just uh, like right now we uh, charge a dollar for folks to register for program. We just want some kind of commitment from the parents as well, right? And you know, I'll just tell you guys a quick story. I didn't think, over after 15 years, I didn't think one dollar would mean so much for someone. I get parents calling me right now have four or five children. To pay for a program usually costs maybe two, three hundred dollars. Imagine you put four kids in a program, fifteen hundred dollars. They call me crying like I never thought I would be able to put all four in in a program and get some benefit for these kids. So those are the things impact. Again, impact, right? A dollar. Never thought a dollar would have so much impact. Right? And, and we know it does. We know every dollar has a huge impact. But when you break, break it down into that simplistic, like a pair of crying, like I never thought I could put four kids into a program, that means something. That means something. And you're making an impact there. So if you guys go out and you're making that small of an impact, you're changing the world. Trust me. That's it, 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 emphasize the question. Great question, and it's answered by the guy that runs the business, right? So that's what he's had to do, all right? Let me put it in the context of eSports. If you join the eSports club, no adult supervision, you want money, what do you do? You either bring it out of your pocket, the, the, the curriculum basically is gold fundraising. How many STEM curriculums is, is marketing, advertising, and fundraising? You teach the kids, although they're playing video games, that's the focus. Send them out to do car washes. Send them out to do bottle collections. Now, if you want to tie them into the community, send them out to go clean a veteran's yard. Go clean the disability yard, right? Go fix the ramp, go clear the path. Make money, because every esports at every level, middle school, high school, and above, there's tournaments all year round. If you guys look it up, NASAP, you'll go find out that that's the free one. But esports gaming out there, you guys can participate as individuals. One of the biggest trends going on right now is colleges having their esports clubs, right? If you weren't playing the sports, you were on the lacrosse first club. Frisbee club, you name it. There's a sports club now. I don't know if we'll ever get them all the computers if the kids in college figure out how to play sports. I get my 12 pack or six pack on the side, I wouldn't have to get up. Most of them will just move into the bathroom. I mean, sit in one place. You don't even have to socialize with anybody. It's all busy, right? 
and you could talk, question. and you could talk to them on a headset. That's yep. cool. That's, that's only cool kids, though. Mm, so, they're cool kids. <laughs> what was your question? You got a hand up? I was actually going to mention the financial aspect, but also uh, what uh, what's the age groups? I know you mentioned like younger kids, but also from high schoolers that kind of thing. Yeah. So for us, we are really impacting like kids at the youngest age. So. We have from kindergarten all the way through high school, but then we have career pathway programs where we're teaching kids how to be referees and coaches and giving back to and paying them. So this summer we had our first cohort, cohort go through. They were refing uh, flag football games over the summer, summer league flag football, and they were making $20, $25 a game, um, which, you know, which is Huge. We got them PC um, Positive Coaching Alliance, their certifications, um, first aid, AED, CPR, concussion. Uh, so these kids can use these skills outside of Bridgeport and outside the school when you know it's a certification. It's one of those great. You actually had funded the program. But that's a sustainable that's a part. Sustainability. Yeah. Where you teach again? We do. We, we go, when you go to a, a, a basketball tournament. Or a cross one, there's an entry fee. Yep. And they, you pay for referees. Okay? What better way than teaching your athletes to actually mm -hmm. referee the same sport that they like and figure out that on the weekend you can make $40 a game? That's your pocket money. And they're doing it in high school. That, 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 that to me is a solution among that community instead of the privilege, the kids I used to coach in Milford, right? Hey, you know. You're good enough, maybe you're not the best player. You know, here's a refereeing opportunity. Yeah. And now they're coming to coach his teams. Yeah. What's it take to coach fifth and sixth grade lacrosse? Yeah. Patience. Okay. <laughs> or soccer. Big adults come out doing it because they're making money because they're doing it on the side. Yeah, and that Let's was train our, our own kids to do it. And that's what our biggest challenge. Okay. Like adults, it pays. They they they're not appreciative of that, right? And so if you empower a high school kid. Um, they love that because you're giving them some money. Um, they feel like some kind of leadership and they're mentoring to like a third and fourth grader, right? So you take a senior and you give him a, co uh, a team of kids in second and third grade, oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful connection right there, right? Those kids get to look up to that guy. That guy get to be a leader and mentor some kids. And those are tangible skills that last them for life, right? That aspect is actually simpler to occupy for us, and he's been, he's already had it, is running it, aside from the esports, is they follow a curriculum to be certified to be official coaches in the state of Connecticut, all right? So, you know, that's a curriculum in itself that leads to a certificate. These kids aren't in school for that. And now they have a certificate, now they're making money, and it's just a very simple connection that simple. shows them where else they go. Simple. Okay? That's a benefit. That's a solution that actually has them coming to the our program and participate. And I focus on solutions, guys. That my program, I focus on solutions, right? Because we all could talk about problems. I've been to tons of meetings, sit with mayor, senators. I sat with Senator Moore this morning, right? And it's like we keep going around. We're on a hamster wheel. We're just on a hamster wheel. Everybody's just talking, talking, talking. But where's the solutions? Where's the solutions that are actually impacting these kids, right? That are actually changing their life. These kids can't write. If you ask most of these kids, most of you guys can't write. It's like, the, it's this. It's this. The, so we call these tactile skills. How many of you guys can do this? How many of you guys can do this? How many of you guys can do this? Okay? We call those tactile skills. These kids, they don't have that. Critical thinking. These kids aren't being taught critical thinking skills anymore. Just think about those things. And those are what really change the world. If you can't use your hands, if you can't build anything, right? Like, the world is made of us making buildings or you know, making a fire. If I can't use my hands to make a fire, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna feed myself? How am I gonna stay warm, right? So those are the, the, the skills and the tools that they have taken away from these kids 
that I see we have to give these kids these skills back. Tactical skills. How few you guys can't do this? And it's crazy to me. Like, why can't you do this? Oh, they're going to be practicing all the rest of this year. Yeah, See, I, I gave them some. They're going to be practicing. You know, but they those are them. Um, I wanted to know if you guys had any suggestions for how we as college students can spark interest in engineering within the community. Because personally, I'm a part of a registered student organization where we just created a pre-collegiate initiative. And we're trying to think of ways we can get um, pre-collegiate um, is is this a volunteer organization? Yes, it's Nesby. Oh, it's Nesby. Oh, so okay. We're going to go locally here. Yeah. Around the country. So. Oh wow. You're going to go. The, the way to get involved, mm -hmm. right, is to go find community-based programs. Yeah. All right. Whether it's supported by a college or by other some other thing, Nesby has a lot of connections with different organizations that are already in place. Mm -hmm. And you no, go. Not yet. Not yet. Well, you're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a big support structure. Yeah. Nesby. Awesome. Um, when you do that, all right, you reach out even to that organization. They may have some nonprofits locally, uh, local, whether they're um, any kind of any kind of community service-based program, right? Um, will will have the opportunity for you to come in as volunteers. Yeah. Now, from an engineering point of view, you want to put together stuff like uh, STEM STEM speakers presentation. Go ask them if they're going to be. Give them a half hour, and then you get your volunteers to go in. How do you become an engineer? How do you get them to be interested in STEM? There's a great YouTube video out there for curiosity. I run a STEM class too. I'll even send you notes if you want. But STEM, you introduce first and second graders, STEM, to that kind of process, you get them interested. Yeah. And then this class is even cool. Yeah. All right. And what, why I say that is because I, when I went through engineering, all right, if I look in the mirror, I saw all the guys that were with me. didn't do me well. I had to run the town before I figured out other things to do. <laughs> okay, but it, it works, don't get me wrong. We've done it for years, you know, we made airplanes and all that stuff, but the new solutions that we don't know, all right, and it's not that we don't know the solution, we don't know the problems that are involved in that. And based on society, we already know what the problems are. It's one of our fundamental problems of communicating with each other, all right? And if you start with a, a, an open topic and an open mind to have these conversations and you actually have technical data to back them and support it, that they represent. When you show up in STEM, you should be looking yeah. at people that are looking at you and they recognize themselves in you. And they say, if you can do it, I can do it. And 90% and of the time is that. Like, when I show up, I look like the kids. I could talk to them about lacrosse, why they should play lacrosse and stuff like that. That's important too. Um, but, you know, just showing up and being consistent, I would say that's the most important thing. You can't show up for kids and then promise them stuff and then they don't show up. They've been disappointed by adults a lot, right? A lot of adults disappoint them. And so don't be one of those persons who disappoint kids. You'll never forget about it. Yeah, consistency is important. And you'll see that in that, those types of organizations. So. Yeah, so that's one of the challenges that, that we're going to have is how do we can, can we use what we're seeing here and extend it to, you know, maybe other geographical areas? You know, maybe there's examples in our area. Can, can that be, can what the folks in Bridgeport have done, can that be duplicated in our area? I don't know, maybe these are opportunities that, that you might want to explore. Um, be it for a, a project. Inclusive design doesn't necessarily have to be a project, right? It could be a, a service, an environment. The, you know, the form could be whatever provides that solution. Right? So um, I want to uh, present special, a gift to our special guest speakers. We have certificates oh, wow. for Mr. Wilson, Mr. Lonegan, and we have a nice we mask blanket for Don Wilson oh, wow. <laughs> with the warm uh, New England I'm going to start a fire know. now. We got a warm <laughs> blanket. <laughs> uh, you going to take a picture of us? Yeah, I'll we take a picture. You want to finish your class first?
left, it's 5.15, so the class is over. Which class is over? Yeah, I'm thinking about it. How about a, first, how about a hand for... I hope you guys really got something out of this because that's the point, right? How do we change... Other